Welcome back to Paris Lesbos, the most fabulous podcast in the world. And today we're doing a foil fencer, World War One ambulance driver, and a pain in the ass to Una Trubridge and character inspiration for the writer Radcliffe Hall. It's Tubi Lowther. Who? A side character, but one with a very interesting story all her- on her own. I see. Well, where does she begin? In London, she's born in 1874 as May Lowther to a Royal Navy lieutenant. She also has an older sister and brother but none of them ever get married. Interesting. Now, do we know if they're also gay? No, we do know that her sister, Amay Lowther, is a famous actress. In fact, Oscar Wilde once remarked, Amay, if you were only a boy, I could adore you. All right, then. So certainly moving in interesting circles, if nothing else. Yes. So why to be? We're not entirely sure. Her biographer actually says it's unknowable and unguessable. My personal guess is it's a family nickname that then just everyone in private and in public started calling her, and she didn't really care. Hmm. Well, it certainly makes her stand out. Yes. Now, what we do know of her is that she was educated by governesses and then shipped off to the French boarding school Les Rouches, where Natalie Barney had also once stayed. Only Lowther actually graduated from there and then went on to spend some time at the Sorbonne University in Paris. Fancy. So now, did she and Natalie um, meet each other at any time during that schooling, or, or were they just at different times? Not during schooling. They We do know that they met later in life because Tupi actually visited Natalie at her salon. There's a drawing Natalie did of her salon from like the front door to her temple of friendship in the backyard and it has everyone's names scrawled in it in tiny tiny writing and you'll find t lowther Mm -hmm. in there that's handy (laughs) nice of her to label that for people in the future yes natalie and her lists and labeling of very private parts of her life that we now scour through right because like For so many of these ladies, um, part of the problem is that they didn't document stuff because it was, you know, scandalous. And um, that made sense at the time because then they couldn't be blackmailed if anyone got into their papers. But nowadays, when you're trying to say X person was a lesbian or these two people had a relationship, it's it's much harder than it would be if, if they had been as transparent. Yes, Lowther did not write much, or if she did, it has not come down to us in the 21st century. Pity. Now, unlike her sister, she was never presented to the queen. Huh. Now, why would this be? Because she was already a sporting celebrity throughout England and France in fencing and lawn tennis, where she was also an international champion. Dang. So, what, the queen doesn't like seeing jocks? The Queen was not impressed, and apparently because she was so well-known, there was no real need to have her come out in society and meet the Queen and all of that that we saw with Renee Vivian. Uh Aha, so she's just kind of circumventing that social norm. Now, at the time, did we have this uh, stereotype that we have today where uh, women who are in sports are considered sapphic kind of by default? I mean, you see, like, with the um, Canadian and American hockey teams that they keep on dating each other, for instance? I don't know about stereotypes exactly. I do know that at one point Natalie Barney and even Renee Vivian did a little bit of fencing themselves, though not at all competitively. I also know that the bisexual Olga de Meyer was a sportswoman as well. In tennis, she actually played with Lowther at several points. There's references to Wine Array Singer, but that might just be because Demeyer had a fling with Wine Aretta at one point. Mm. So it was maybe that um, affluent women who wanted to do sports um, ended up doing fencing and tennis and things. Uh, and it may, may or may not have overlapped with there being sapphic. It was not as clear a stereotype, maybe, at the time as it is now. Yes, at the time, there were specific sports that were seen as more suitable for upper-class young women. Fencing was quite new. They actually limited them to only the foil 
because it is the lightest blade out of mm. the three. The the other two fencing blades are saber and epee saber. You can imagine saber like on horseback in cavalry, only this time it's on foot. Epe is the heaviest blade. It's also triangular, which is fun fact why you cannot take the button off the end of a modern epe and turn it into a point, because at that point that is a weapon that is illegal under the Geneva Convention. Dang. So so only the dainty blades for the ladies. Yes, only the dainty blades. There is also no mixed fencing, really, at this point. It's women fencing other women. But not in a gay way. Not in a gay way. Not on the strip, at least. Save it for the locker room. (laughs) No, were there any locker room romances for Toopy? Not that we know of. Mm, So if there were, she was very discreet. Yes. That or no one bothered to write about, and neither did she. Hmm. Now, she did regularly compete and do fencing exhibitions for audiences. The press loved her. Mm, How come? Her prowess with the blade, her performances in competitions, and her personality, she was apparently quite charming. Oh, wonderful. So it's kind of like the the sports uh, celebrities of today where, you know, you admire them on the field and then in the after game interviews, you're like, oh, damn. <laughs> they have a sense of humor, too. Yes, she did give quite a lot of interviews, and she even wrote for some of the women's articles for oh, some of the women's magazines. Interesting. So was she a writer as well as a fencer? She didn't really write much. Later on, she actually composed music, which the composition still exists, but they're not performed nowadays. Hmm. Just because she wasn't a particularly well-known composer? Correct. She is not Mozart or, I don't know, Beethoven. During her sporting career, was that kind of who she was, just a a star athlete? Did she have a life outside of that? Obviously, she had a life outside of that, but it apparently did not make it into newspapers. Mm. (laughs) So avoiding scandal, unlike some of our other ladies. Yes. Though... Slightly scandalous. She didn't like the skirt that was used for women fencing back then. She wanted knickers like we have in modern fencing, so short pants that end at the knee, and we have long socks now that meet us at the knee. And not underwear, because knickers does sound like underwear to me. Not underwear. They look <laughs> nothing like underwear. For one, they're very tight. Mm-hmm. Ooh, so was was this scandalous at the time? Because I can picture in a time where women were mainly wearing longer dresses or loose-fitting pants, seeing a woman's whole leg. Yeah, if we were to take the modern fencing get-up and put it back then, it would be quite scandalous. Because today it's rather tight, because especially in Epe, at least... If there's too much excess fabric, then your opponent's blade gets caught up in that and the point goes off against just the fabric and not you. So you have lost a point and you can lose a match that way. Mm, so you're you're dodging with your skirt as well as your body. That would, I imagine, be harder to control than just your own movement. Yes, though it should be noted that in foil, the target is only your torso and neck. So at least at the time it was fine, because she was just fencing with foil. But um, but she's maybe a bit forward-thinking. Yes. Now, not all were pleased with her fencing skill. There were actually angry letters and news reports when she beat up one of the male instructors in front of an audience. <clears throat> yeah, that, um, that harkens back to, there have been a lot of instances where women have uh, played against men and succeeded and that kind of pushes back against the stereotype that men are always going to win against women i remember there was a a story of a um female pitcher who struck out babe ruth and was uh not allowed to play anymore (laughs) yeah but it, it does seem like people like to have their ideas about uh what women can do and what men can do and never the twain shall meet yes though in this case Tupi did get to keep fencing. Her father threatened to duel someone, though, and that was 
the end of that. I see. Now, was her father a good duelist as well? Was was he good at fencing? Are those the same thing? No. They are pretty much the same thing. Fencing is the sport that came out of dueling. So not only were women of the time banned from using the saber or the epée, they were also banned from dueling either for money or for honor. Mm, but the men weren't banned from this. Correct. So in this case of honor, her father had to step up and challenge people to duels, even though she was the fencer. Wow, that's kind of sad, but I guess good that she had a supportive family. Yes, her father was actually quite supportive. It was his wish for her to go to the Sorbonne University, which was odd at the time, women going to college. Mm -hmm. Wow, and what did she study there? It said she studied en science, so sciences. Just all sciences? Well, she never graduated, despite what some people say. Her biographer, uh, in her research, discovered that she never actually graduated. She just took classes. Hmm. Well, it's good she got an education, at least. Did it, would that ever serve her? I mean, you said that she did musical compositions later. Did she do any sort of scientific research? Not that we know of. We do know that her language ability, speaking French and German, would be of quite a bit of use when World War I comes along. I see. Are we there yet? <laughs> no, we're not there yet. Hold your horses. <laughs> All right, I'll hold my horse. <laughs> we're still dealing with blades. Because she abandons competitive fencing in 1904 when she's 30 years old. Though she keeps up with doing tennis. Hmm. Now why does she abandon fencing? Not entirely sure. She doesn't exactly get tired of it, though. We know she becomes the chairman of the ladies' circle de scream, circle of fencing. It's all in French. And not about screaming? No, it is not about screaming, even if people do scream at competitions. Gotcha. We also know that her possibly last tournament was a 1909 team event with Olga de Meyer, which they lost. Well, that's too bad. She also continued writing articles into the 1920s. It might be that she physically wanted to focus more on tennis than she did on fencing. Mm. Now, fencing is a pretty, like, physically demanding sport, so I guess that would make sense. Yes. I don't know how well they would have done with the older fencing then, though she was only 30. But nowadays, we also have wheelchair fencing, and we have international competitions with 80-year-olds. Dang. But I guess to each their own, everyone has their limits. And um, maybe without, like, accessibility stuff that we have now, it might have been a bit harder. Yes, it might have also been wanting to focus on other things or not be in the spotlight as much as she got older. Who knows? There is no real mention of boxing, of her taking up boxing, though many people, including Una Trowbridge, mention it. It is thought that if she did try out boxing, it would have been brief and in private. She wouldn't have done this in public. Because boxing sounds like more of a masculine sport to be doing. Um, would that have like affected her reputation? Yes. Gotcha. So it's maybe the people talking about her boxing are the ones who don't want to show her in such a nice light. Yes, as we will continue with, Truebridge is to be taken with quite a bit of salt. The same scenario of boxing can be applied to jujitsu, which she is also said to have possibly done. Hmm. Now. She meets the writer Radcliffe Hall in 1906 at the European spa town of Bad Homburg. Mm -hmm. The writer Radcliffe Hall, whom a lot of people will have heard of um, because of her book, The Well of Loneliness. Which I call the Woe is Me Pity Party. Right. Um, <laughs> which uh, was a classic of lesbian literature for many people for decades, um, but also is just incredibly depressing. So, so depressing. And I haven't even read the entire thing, only bits. Mm-hmm. But you, you get a sense of it. So who was Radcliffe Hall at the time? What was she up to? Not a heck of a lot, but as the two become friends, she also encounters Mabel Batten and 
Hall and Batten end up being lovers. Mm. Now, at this time, was Tupi, like, out? Was she, like, did... I mean, obviously, she wouldn't be out to, like, the general public at large, but um, did she have a sense of her sapphicness, and was she sharing that with other sapphic people? I would say yes, she was out just to the general circle, because she's even referenced as a lesbian by other people and in other people's biographies. So the trio basically become old friends, and then World War I starts. Ooh, now that tends to interrupt a lot of people's lives and plans. What does Tupi do? Nothing initially. Because in 1915, Una Trubridge meets Radcliffe Hall, and there's tensions galore in the friend group. The affair between Hall and Mabel basically ends, and then Mabel dies in 1916. And then, in 1917, Tupi decides... She's going to start an ambulance unit. The Hackett Lowther Ambulance Unit, made up of all women, minus any age restrictions, and with Nora Hackett in charge of the canteen section while she is in charge of the drivers. So, two questions. One, it, no age restriction. Was that a usual thing for the time? The average age of a woman ambulance driver was early 20s, so 22, 21. But did other groups um, make it so it was only that? or Since it's specifically mentioned in several places that there was no age limit, I have to say yes. Also because there are several accounts of other ambulance drivers in different units where they were worried about their age being an issue. But I cannot find a definitive source specifically saying there is a cutoff age for, for instance, the, the Voluntary Aid Detachment or for the Scottish Women's Hospitals Unit or any of the others. Gotcha. Now, is there like a reason that she would want to do or that they would want to have this to open it up more? Was it just the idea that a lot of people are being denied the opportunity to help and this is a way of giving them that opportunity? Some of the latter of letting just any woman in, but you also have to keep in mind the typical ambulance driver, woman ambulance driver anyway, during the Great War, was an upper class young woman who paid for the privilege of driving wounded men along the front. Mm. Was this such a group? Were they all fancy and well to do? More of them were, yes, but. I get a less touristy vibe. Gotcha. So it wasn't just, oh, let's go to the different places and see all the different things. There was also some element of actually trying to do something practically useful. Yes, which is also part of the reason Lowther does not bother to attach the unit to the British. She goes straight to the top of the French army to General Catan with her plan. And he agrees to it. So the unit is attached to the French army and will also serve under fire, which was unusual. Dang. Yeah, so they put their money where their mouth was. Yeah, so it must be noted that serving in a different ambulance unit wouldn't mean that you weren't ever under fire. You could still be under shell fire. But the Hackett Lowther unit would be much, much closer to the front. Gotcha. Now, who is this Hackett lady? That is Nora Hackett, another woman of about the same age who is in charge of a different section. Does she and Tupi know each other before this? What is? Why did they decide to form this together? So Nora Hackett was already quite well known to the French army because she was the director of the already well-established Women's Emergency Corps Canteen for Soldiers in France. Wow, gotcha. So she already knew how to organize ways to help soldiers, and so Tupi knew, oh, this is a person who knows what she's doing. Yes, though it's up for debate if Hackett willingly left her position and then joined Tupi, or if Tupi went and convinced her and basically poached her for her own organization. <laughs> gotcha. Well, so how did things turn out? Um, 
Did they end up getting hurt? Did they do things that were useful to the cause? Definitely useful. They arrived in France in January of 1918, and by March were in Compiègne, just in time for the Ludendorff Offensive. Mm, which was significant? The Ludendorff Offensive was pretty much a last-ditch effort for the Germans to defeat the French and the British before the American armies arrived. Because the Americans, who had been out of the war until 1917, and who don't really get any troops into France until 1918, are completely fresh. They haven't spent years slogging through the mud in the trenches. They're not worn down at all, and they can just bring an onslaught. Right, so this was then a really decisive battle, because if the Germans had gotten enough in hand, then they might have actually been able to press their advantage and make it a lot more difficult for the Americans to come in and win. Yes. Specifically, they were hoping to defeat the French and the British before the Americans set foot in France. Mm -hmm. This is an important time for Tupi and her gang to be helping out. Yes, burying the wounded from the front to hospitals and aid stations and that sort of thing. If you want a more detailed description of what it was like, there is the novel Not So Quiet that you can read. Gotcha. So there, there is documentation of what this was like. This service in Compiègne actually gets to be the Croix de Guerre. Ah, which we have discussed before as a medal that you can get for doing important things for the French military. Yes. Though not the highest honor, but still not a participation medal by any means. Right. So, so? She was recognized for her work. That's pretty wonderful. How did she deal with life afterward? We're not there yet. The oh, war we're still, still isn't war? over. Yes. This because is a long the unit. War. It's a four year long war, but it's only really one year here. But anyway, the unit is attached to the French First Army in August and continues following them. And then the war ends. However, the unit does not get sent home. They are instead attached to the occupying French army in Germany and only disband in March of 1919, having survived the war with zero drivers wounded in action. Nice. But also, why were they? Why did they just stay there in, in Germany for that long? What was that about? They were specifically invited. Invited. So what, what were they doing? Not a lot. There's descriptions of entertainment with balls and dances every evening and innumerable French officers ready and available to dance until dawn for six weeks, and then they went home. Interesting. So they were great at what they did, very competent. Also, good to have at a party. So they've had their wartime, they've had their partying. Um, what is civilian life like after all this? Well, we have one last bit because... Oh my god, this war never ends. <laughs> it's the war to end all wars. It must end. Yeah. Anyway, so so what's the last part? The war service also meant that Tupi and every member of the unit were eligible for the Victory and British War Medals from England. Participation medals, basically. So she returned to England a second lieutenant with three medals. Fancy. Now, it's civilian life, and she continues her friendship with Radcliffe Hall, throws parties, visits friends, and she's described as sort of having a salon, but I would not imagine it to be like Natalie's, where Natalie is promoting different people and forming connections between different writers and other artistic people and people who have publishing endeavors. It doesn't sound like Tupi is doing that. It's more that Tupi just knows how to throw a good party. Yes, and she's in a very artistic milieu. Gotcha. So, not as formal, not as fancy as, as Natalie's thing, but fun. Yes, and there is, naturally, some confusion. Truebridge says that Tupi threw a party for Romaine Brooks when she visited. Other biographers say that Romaine invited her to a party because Natalie asked her to. It gets very confusing, and there's a great deal of escalation in writing. Ah, but so Truebridge is trying to imply that she and Romaine had a thing? 
that Tupi had a crush on Romaine. Do we have any evidence of this? Not outside of Truebridge. Interesting. So at some point we might want to get to uh, why exactly Truebridge is saying all these things that cast aspersions on Tupi's character. We're about to get there. Mm -hmm. We do have to take a short, minor detour into Radcliffe Hall's writing. Radcliffe Hall had previously written a novel that was very much a Romain Aclef, meaning very much based on real life and real people, but with changed names, and it led to a lawsuit. Dang. Did she win it? Yes, she was accused of slander against St. George Lane Fox Pitt, who had in anger described her to the Secretary of the Society for Physical Research as a thoroughly immoral woman. Dang. Now, this is a very minor-seeming incident in the life of Radcliffe Hall, and in specifically Tupi Lowther's life, except that this comes back because in 1928, the Well of Loneliness, what I refer to as the Woe is Me Pity Party, is published. And and why should that have any problem for Tupi, and, and why should that reflect this previous lawsuit? Because the ambulance driver unit in this novel, the Breakspear unit it's called, is very obviously based off of the Hackett Lowther unit. And people know this, and people talk, and there's even talk of the main character, Stephen Gordon, being somewhat based off of Tupi Lowther. Oof. So, <laughs> Radcliffe is at it again, then. <laughs> yes, she's at it again, writing about real-life people without their permission, really. Mm -hmm. Now, what makes this different from, like, Natalie Barney writing some fairly transparent Romana clefs? Natalie Barney's writing is never that popular. This book basically flies off the shelves. There's a obscenity charge and trial in England that even Virginia Woolf is speaking at. It's all over the news. Gotcha. It's so everywhere. This is, this is front page stuff. This is not like Natalie, who, you know, if you're a lesbian in Paris, then you know who she is. But otherwise, she can keep more of a low profile. Yes. So people are talking. Mm -hmm. And and does this affect Tupi's life? Yes, it actually ends her friendship with Hall and is described as why Truebridge is bitter at Lowther, even after Lowther dies. Dang. So it sounds like there was a lot of bad blood after this. Yes, there was quite a lot of bad blood. And after this, there's not really that much about Lowther. So we know, for instance, that she takes up golf, piano, and singing, that she writes compositions that survive to today but aren't performed. We know that she travels. For instance, there is a story told in Dolly Wilde's biography of when Tupi Lowther wore pants and tried to cross the Franco-Italian border. She was stopped for masquerading as a man. So when she came back to cross the border again, she was wearing a skirt and then subsequently arrested for masquerading as a woman. Dang. <laughs> Legend. I love it. So so even though she was facing this kind of scandal and, and it probably really impacted her life being so out in the public eye, didn't stop her from having some hijinks and shenanigans. She spends a lot more time with her goddaughter, though Trowbridge spins this as more like a relationship. But considering everything that has happened between Tupi and Trowbridge and Hall, I would take it with quite a lot of salt. Right, because Trowbridge, by this point, sounds like she is lying about just about everything. Um, do we actually or just know twisting. If... Right, right, right. Um, do we know if Tupi ever had like, relationships with anyone? Because so far, we know that she's a lesbian because people write about it. Um, but I haven't heard any credible thing about her in anyone else. There is no mention of it in her biography. Wow. So, a very well-known lesbian at the time. But no known lady friend. Not unless you believe Truebridge. Right, which, you know, we could. It could have been. But I would need evidence that is not Truebridge. 
Yeah, that isn't someone who has a vested interest in poisoning all of the gossip about her. Now, she does outlive both of her siblings and then dies of tuberculosis in 1944. Ooh, that's rough. Was anyone there to take care of her during the end? Her goddaughter was close to her. Mm -hmm. And at one point, they actually lived in the same house. I believe it was after her goddaughter's divorce. Mm. Now, who's her goddaughter? Fabienne de Villa. Do we know how she knew her parents? So her mother, Gertrude Brethu Lafargue, née Jones, was also a student of Le Rouge. So at school. That's sweet. So her school friends were... Helping her out, at least she had connections from before that carry through to now. I feel like a lot of these women, um, once you get to the end of their lives, the people who they care about most have abandoned them or already died. Um, and it's nice to see someone who like has someone there with her at the end, you know? Yes. Though that is not the end of Tupi Lowther being referenced. There is a Tupi Lowther cup that the Ladies' Annual Fencing Union, held as a competition until 1988, when the competition was discontinued, and the cup has since gone missing. Now, she does show up in other people's writing. She shows up in True Bridges' diaries, as we've seen. She shows up in the diary of Maybelle Batten. She also shows up in novels, including ones about suffragettes. There is a graphic novel trilogy called Suffragitsu, Mrs. Pankhurst's Amazons. Ooh, that's fun. Now, was she a suffragette at any time? It does not appear so, but she may have run into them because there's talk of a gym and something called Bartitsu, which is how I think she shows up in those graphic novels. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure that she was, as an unconventional woman, attracted likewise to other unconventional women in their pursuit of pushing the boundaries of what was possible for women at the time. So what have we learned from her life then? What does Tupi tell us about how to be friends? Friends don't let friends write fanfic about them without their permission. 